Uh, Senator Tyrrell has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown as item 12 on today's order of business. Is the pro proposal supported? <laughs> Thank you. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Obviously, this is my very first time doing an NPI, so I apologise. Um, students shouldn't have to go broke doing practical placement for, to finish their studies. Imagine if we told all politicians, nah, you're not getting paid for the next few months. You're still expected to do your full workload as normal, but we just won't pay you for it. I don't think they'd go for that. And I reckon most people would think it's a pretty unreasonable thing to ask. So why do we expect students to do it? Students doing degrees like nursing, teaching and social work are required to do a practical placement to finish their studies. We're screaming out for people to go and study these degrees. We should be doing everything we can to encourage people to take up these careers. You know what doesn't encourage people? You know what actually turns people away from finishing their degrees and entering these careers? Making them choose between buying groceries and paying rent. Making them turn down their regular part-time or casual job for three or so months, risking their future income. Putting such pressures on them that they develop anxiety, which in turn affects their performance at uni and at work. At the moment, we're saying to prospective nurses and teachers that unless you can live with no income for a few months, then you can't do the job. I don't think that stacks up. The university's accord is looking at this issue right now. The interim report recognised that mandatory unpaid placements places significant pressures on students. Students from regional areas, like my patch in Tassie, can be some of the most disadvantaged. They often have to fork out for transport, parking and accommodation costs to do the placement on top of undertaking an unpaid placement. It's been sad, said time to and again, but we're in a cost of living crisis. It's clear that we can't keep asking people to work for free when all they're trying to do is seek an education, an education that would lead them to fill critical workforce shortages. The University Accord interim report suggests we should consider some kind of financial support for students required to undertake practical placement. Constituents have suggested that maybe we could look at expanding youth allowance or off study, but I think that any increase like this would be marginal and it wouldn't go far enough in supporting students and providers. And what about those students who can't access youth allowance or Aus study? Providers also need to be incentivised because without quality practical experience in the field, our students and industry suffer, our broader community suffers. So here's what I think we should do. The federal government should give funding directly to placement providers to pay students for their placement work. The providers can decide what wage they want to offer students, but they'd be required to pass on at least a minimum wage. I know what you're thinking if we're telling businesses they need to start paying for student placements on top of everything else, they're not going to be able to afford it. They'll just choose not to put on any students. So part of the funding from the government should be a kickback to the provider for taking on student workers. The government already offers incentives for companies that take on apprentices, and this scheme could be similar. These payments would be passed on to both public and private placement providers as long as these providers meet the required educational standards to host a placement. Universities should adjust to a new model too. If students are out in the field, it means they're not sitting in the classroom, doing lectures and requiring, uni and requiring university resources. Universities shouldn't be charging students the same fees for placement units as they do for units in the classroom. A cap of 25 per cent should be placed on universities for all practical placement units. This stops universities making money off students for units where the bulk of the learning is provided by an external organisation or institution. It's pretty clear that we need to reform the way mandatory practical placements are done. Teachers, nurses and paramedics are some of our most essential frontline workers. 
And if we say they can only do these jobs if they can afford not to pay their rent for six to 12 weeks, then why would anybody do it? If people want to work in these fields, we should be rolling out the welcome mat, not making it impossible for them to succeed before they even start. Our first message to new students shouldn't be, you don't deserve to be paid. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President, and I want to thank Senator Tyrrell for bringing this issue to the Senate. And of course, cost of living pressures on university students is a very important issue. Uh, so many students are battling to pay the rent and to put food on the table. And so I really appreciate, Senator Tyrrell, you raising this issue. Certainly, uh, I have also spoken with many uh, groups, including uh, students, which have raised uh, these concerns. And student placement so often occurs in the health sector. So whether a student is studying nursing or uh, um, OT or some other um, allied health course, so often they are required to do a practical placement uh, in the workplace. And of course, with that comes a very, very significant cost. Now that cost is made so much worse because of the fact that under this government, because of Labor's cost of living crisis, we saw a 7.1 per cent increase in hex debts apply from the 1st of June. Now, that has driven up the average cost of a hex debt by $1,700 a year, and that is in fact impacting more than 3 million Australians. And we know, in fact, that Australians right across this country are suffering under this government. The cost of living crisis, whether it's paying the rent, paying the mortgage, putting food on the table, paying the power bill, uh, it, it is excruciating. And it is the only thing that people are talking about, frankly, in their communities, in their families. So, as I say, I do want to thank Senator Tyrrell for raising this issue. I have to say students in rural and regional communities face even greater cost of living pressures because it's not just the pressures of day-to-day -day living if you live in a city and go to university in that city. If you are a regional or rural student or you come from a remote area, uh, so often you are facing an additional cost of many, many thousands of dollars. Now, of course, uh, there is support for students. There is a range of different support for students that the government provides, but it is simply not enough. And my concern, as the Shadow Minister for Education, is that this is going to be more and more of a disincentive for students to take up study. So the government talks big on universities. The government talks big on opening the door to students, and yet the government has failed to address this issue. The government has failed to even deal with the situation at the moment where there is an outdated HEX payment system. So if you are a student at university and you are repaying your HEX debts in real time, those payments are not being accounted for until the end of the financial year. So that is appalling. I have raised this with the ATO Commissioner. The Education Minister has promised and committed to do something about it, and yet we have seen absolutely no action. So where is the HECS, HECS payment reforms that this government promised? Before the last election, the Labor, Labor Party was full of promises. They promised cheaper mortgages. They promised lower inflation. They promised not to touch franking credits, not to raise taxes. They promised to cut power bills by $275 a year. The reality is that under Labor, all Australians are hurting. Under Labor, Australian university students are hurting, and I condemn this government for its lack of action when it comes to cost of living relief for Australian university students. Thank you. Senator Henderson has moved earlier today. We'll now move to the first speech, and I call Senator Kavasic to make her first speech.
and asks senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. Senator Cavassi. Thank you, Madam President. I stand before you to deliver my maiden speech as a senator. I am humbled and honoured to have been entrusted with this responsibility, and I am committed to serving the interests of New South Wales and Australia with dedication and integrity. I have the deepest gratitude to the New South Wales Liberal Party and our members for this opportunity, to those who have supported me and placed their faith in my ability to be a voice for change. This is a unique opportunity to serve my country, and I do not intend to waste it. I remain acutely aware that my arrival in this place has come in the shadow of sadness as I fill the vacancy that was left by the late Senator Jim Molan. Senator Molan left an indelible mark both through his contributions on the floor of this chamber and a life of service. Jim was a distinguished soldier and military commander, an honourable senator and tireless advocate for a stronger and more secure Australia. His legacy is an example to us all. Australia has long been a nation of opportunity, and these opportunities have blessed my family. I am the daughter of Croatian migrants. In his early 20s, my dad left his home in the small village of Turcinovici in what is now Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was a refugee of the Cold War. Forced to flee because a communist government took away the freedoms and rights that we too often take for granted in Australia. The right to speak freely, the freedom to worship the God of your choice, and the right to earn a living through your own endeavours. He arrived at the Bonagilla migrant camp in Victoria to an unknown country, an unknown people, and an unknown language. But buoyed by this new land of opportunity, he rolled up his sleeves and he got to work. He picked fruit in Mildura, cut cane in North Queensland, mined opals in Lightning Ridge, laboured on the snowy scheme, and I only discovered a few years ago, worked in the asbestos mines in Wittenoo. He did what he needed to make a living without fanfare or victimhood. After he settled in Canberra, he met my mother Lutza, whose story is a different kind of brave. She grew up in the small town of Mishi near Livno, some 100 kilometres from my father's hometown. Her own father died during the Second World War, leaving her young mother with four small children. Their uncle took them in, but they all had to work to earn their keep. My mother had only two years of education. Being both female and poor, education was a luxury preserved for her only brother. My mother's daily job was to tend sheep, and she had many lively tales of battling antagonists such as a story about a two-headed snake, which she tells us she fell with a rock to protect her flock. As we laughed, she insisted it was a true story. You'll have to ask her later. Her determination and sharp intellect defy her lack of formal education, and she laid the foundations for the person that I am today. For my parents to make that choice, to leave their home, to move to the other side of the world, that was an act of extraordinary courage and confidence to seek a new life and opportunity. And for Australia to welcome my parents and the hundreds of thousands like them, that was the act of a country with extraordinary courage and confidence to give a new life and opportunity. My brother Mirko and I were fortunate to be born here in Ngunnawal country and to be part of Australia's multicultural history. With a deep respect and regard for our Croatian roots, we are first and foremost proud and grateful Australians. I acknowledge my beautiful parents, my mother Lutza in the gallery today, and also my father Ivan, who is unable to be here due to his ill health. Father, tata i mama. And my mother's sister, my much loved Tetka Zorka, and my beautiful mother-in-law Barbara, both kind and resilient women. Our parents taught us to think about the future and not to simply accept things the way that they are, to seize opportunities, to be change makers and to fight for things that matter. This is my family history, my story and the fabric of who I am. It is special to me, but it is not unique. It is a migrant story, one that I share with millions of Australians. 
Together, these stories are a part of Australia's history, sitting alongside the experience of our Indigenous First Peoples with over 65,000 years of culture and custodianship of this land and our British heritage and its institutions which we have inherited. This is the story of Australia, a tale of courage, hope and opportunity. Madam President, I was born in Queanbeyan and grew up in Canberra. And during my teens, every Sunday as we drove to church, I watched as something very special rose into existence. I, it captured my attention and my awe and it really felt special. And it was the evolution of this building, our Parliament House that rose before me between 1980 and 1987. That girl on her way to church might have dreamt but never would have believed that she would one day be a part of the decisions that were being made here. And in making those decisions, I'll be guided by principles of liberalism. I'm proud to be a progressive liberal. At the heart of that liberalism is a belief in the inalienable rights of the individual, personal and economic freedoms. I believe in the freedom of speech, religion and association. I believe in universal access to education and each person's right to seek work and to start their own business. That makes free markets and competition, and that's a, simply an expression of free people, that we must have the freedom to choose the way we live our own lives without fear of discrimination or exploitation, that every person must be treated equally before the law, irrespective of their gender, their culture, their religion, their sexuality, their wealth or their privilege. These rights are inalienable not because a government or a politician says they are, but because they are an essential part of our humanity. It is the protection of these rights that must be the central concern of good governance. I say to my new colleagues that we must be vigilant against threats to Australian liberalism from both right-wing populism and left-wing preoccupations with an equality of outcomes. Modern challenges are changing the role of government. National security threats, climate change, unbridled big tech, inflation and economic uncertainty all require government action because it is only as a collective that we can address these problems. At the same time, the challenges Australians face in their day-to-day -day lives demand a government that is focused on policies which empower the individual and the family by extending and enlarging opportunities. Opportunity means giving people real control over their own lives by shifting power from Canberra to the individual. This means reducing the size of government and sharpening its focus on the root causes of disadvantage and inequality. It means policies which are focused on people not protecting vested interests. I'm here to set an agenda of opportunity. Opportunity that helps Australians achieve their own goals. Opportunity comes in many forms, but I believe its foundations lie in key pillars that are crucial for building our nation's future. Home ownership, small business and women's economic participation. I spent the better part of the last two decades working with people to help them buy their own home, to realise the great Australian dream. This was my world before politics. I've seen firsthand how difficult it is for young Australians to buy their first home. Simply working hard does not appear to be enough anymore. Average property prices have more than doubled as a multiple of wages over the last 30 years. The task of saving for a deposit is even more challenging when rents are also on the rise. As a consequence, if you are under 40, you are less likely today to own a home than in any other time in the modern era. This has a financial and a human impact. Australians want the security and comfort that comes with home ownership. The issue of housing strikes at the very heart of our community's wellbeing and stability. The boom in house prices is driving wealth inequality between property owners and renters and exacerbating an intergenerational inequity between young and old. Those who are not part of the very wealthy struggle to break into the market and have to live further away from their childhood homes, their jobs and established community links. 
I want Australians to be able to own a home. I do not believe that expansions in government-owned public housing will ever be enough to be a serious solution to this crisis. But moreover, government housing will not give people the stability and security that comes with having a home to call your own. It is our duty as leaders to explore innovative policy solutions that balance the aspirations of the next generation with the realities of our housing market. We must allow Australians the choice to unlock and access their own money to buy their own homes. It is an uncontested fact that owning your own home in retirement, not your super balance, but owning your own home, is the single most important factor to ensure living with security and dignity. Yet we cannot access some of our own savings to actually buy our own home. This is particularly the case for women over 55, the fastest growing cohort of homeless in our country. A woman over 55 in crisis, or any person in crisis for that matter, can access their super for emergency expenses, but not for a deposit to buy their own home. How does that make any sense at all? You can spend it, but you can't invest it in an asset that will bring you security. It is counterintuitive and a government policy which hinders individual and economic empowerment of Australians, especially women. The federal government must do more to ensure the supply of homes is increased. The key is to incentivise state and local governments that are prepared to take on more housing, offering funding for transport, better infrastructure and protection of existing open spaces. We should not be afraid to consider tax changes, whether it be capping the number of properties that can be negatively geared, or working with the states to replace stamp duty, or at a minimum, correct decades of bracket creep. A serious plan by this parliament has to deal with the housing crisis and would go a long way to restoring the electorate's faith in political leadership to solve big problems and deliver reform. I believe that economic freedoms are just as important as personal freedoms and that the opportunity to start your own business should be encouraged. Founding and running my own financial services business was one of the most rewarding things that I have done. But my business began in difficult circumstances. While I was blessed to have three children by the time I was 25, life has many twists and turns, and a few years later I found myself a single mother burdened with substantial debts. Soon after, I received an eviction notice for the house I was living in with my children. I was alone, no money, and soon no roof over our heads. It was a turning point in my life. As I sat on our front steps of that rental home clutching that notice, I wept, but I promised myself and my children that I would never find myself in that situation again. Like my parents before me, I seized an opportunity in the most difficult of times. I worked hard, long hours, weekends, writing mortgages and small business loans all over Western Sydney and built a future for myself and my children. That is the transformative opportunity that small business provides. Small and family businesses are the backbone of Australia. They create jobs and invigorate local communities, whether they are a company like mine, a local shop, a community pharmacy, a sole trader or a startup working on cutting edge tech. From the founder's garage, small businesses fuel economic growth, innovation and creativity. Yet these enterprises are increasingly at risk and face an array of hurdles, from bureaucratic red tape to uneven market competition. As a nation, we must recognise their vital role and provide them with the necessary support to not only su survive, but to grow and succeed. While there is no silver bullet that will help small business, we must do more to ensure our markets are competitive and monopolies are broken up. Regulations are streamlined, funding options are accessible, and assistance is tailored, such as inclusion in government and commercial procurement. I will always advocate for a tax system that fosters entrepreneurship and rewards risk. Madam President, before entering this place, much of my community work has been focused on the economic empowerment of women. With my friend Amanda Rose, we co-founded Western Sydney Women. Our goal was to support all women to build financial literacy and enter the workforce from helping identify jobs, manage money, 
prepare resumes and even organising clothing for job interview. Creating the foundations for a better future. Amanda's unwavering support and commitment has impacted the lives of many women, including my own. Understanding your financial position can be a great liberator. I've seen firsthand that a job not only gives an income to support yourself and your family, but is also a chance to build a future and a meaningful career. Women's participation in the Australian economy is an imperative. The untapped potential of women in the workforce is a resource that, when harnessed, can drive our nation's prosperity. We must address systemic barriers, from the exorbitant costs of childcare and lack of parental leave support to the gender pay gap and underrepresentation in leadership roles. A family should not have to do the math as to whether mum or dad, and let's face it, it's usually mum, can afford to go back to work after a baby arrives. It is troubling that the cost of two children in childcare absorbs almost the entirety of the average after-tax female income. While many women may rightfully choose to stay home, particularly in the early years, I believe this should be a choice, not a predetermined financial impost. We should explore new policy solutions like tax deductibility of childcare costs, particularly for small and family business owners, and removing red tape which drives up costs for private operators. Good social policy can also be good economic policy. Again, the remit of courageous leadership. I acknowledge a broader issue in our politics relating to how we speak about and the importance we place on issues that predominantly affect women. It is often felt that while women were speaking up, Canberra was not listening, resulting in a real frustration with politics. This is a long-standing problem that persists over multiple governments. There are no simple solutions here, but I am proud to be part of a wider network of women and men within my party focused on this challenge. I acknowledge the contributions of Charlotte Mortlock, Natalie Ward, Jackie Munro, Sally Betts, Jane Bunkle, Giselle Capterian, Claire Batch, Rebecca Von Hoff and Alex Schumann, and for being the driving force that each of you are. In the world of politics, it's easy to get lost in the chaos and challenges and in self. But I stand here today with a heart full of gratitude, knowing that I couldn't have reached this point without the support of the people that fill this gallery. I'm grateful to my friends, Julie and Lisa and Matt Keane, who saw me when others didn't. We are fortunate to have a person of Julian's character in our parliament. Matt is another person of conviction, a fellow Liberal fighter for the environment and women's economic empowerment. I acknowledge all of our broader local Liberal family, in particular Brian Jepson, Andrew Jetson and Ray and Penny Becchio. I'm thankful to James Wallace, Trent Zimmerman, Alex Hawke, David Begg and Andrew Bragg, all of whom provided invaluable support and guidance to me and backed me in when it mattered the most. To my wonderful team, how lucky am I? You are each brilliant in your own way and I'm grateful for your commitment and support. To my brother Mirko, his beautiful family and my much loved cousins and friends, I want to express my deepest thanks to all of you for being my steadfast allies and pillars of strength. To my husband, Glenn, your blue team got interesting. Thank you for standing by my side, for walking with me through life's many challenges and adventures, not the least of which was embarking on this political journey. We share a beautiful blended family, Anna, Eva, Jack, Kate, Ricky, Joe and Eliza, and of course, two beautiful grandchildren, Milo and Zoe. Thank you to each of you for your love, support and encouragement. But I want to say something in particular to my daughters, Anna and Eva. You are the living definition of my purpose. Without you, I would not be here today, no question. Every time I thought I couldn't, you were the reason I could. When things became impossibly hard, you were the reason I continued. By your own example, you each gave me the courage and the strength to keep fighting so that one day I could stand here and start fighting for others. To my new colleagues, I'm mindful that the respect and trust of the electorate can only be achieved if we work together to earn it. 
by making policy that creates opportunity for all Australians, that opens up each person's own pathways to prosperity and security. It is not only our role, Madam President, but our responsibility, our duty to make this happen. I conclude with the words of one of the first women to sit in this parliament, a great Liberal, Dame Enid Lyons, who has captured a sentiment that strikes me as I begin this journey. I hope that I shall never forget that everything that takes place in this chamber goes out somewhere to strike a human heart, to influence the life of some fellow being, and I believe this too, with all my heart, that the duty of every government whether in this country or any other, is to see that no man, because of the condition of his life, shall ever need, ever need lose his vision of the city of God. Thank you. Well done.
Senators, we will resume uh, back to the current uh, MPI uh, in the name of Senator Cyril, and I'll give the call to Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank Senator Tyrrell for raising this issue, an issue that is deeply important in the context of the skills crisis that we are facing in this country, and particularly given that this is an issue, along with so many other issues, that have been ignored by the previous government for nine very long years. And let's not forget that, as well as ignoring this particular aspect, of people's education and the development of skills in this country, they also doubled the cost of numerous degrees, making it so much harder for students. And then, of course, there were the changes to HECS. All of these things have created an environment where our higher education system is in need of extreme amounts of repair. We have many students in courses like nursing, teaching, early education and social work that are required to undertake a set amount of hours of placement in their area to be able to graduate appropriately from their degree. These placements are frequently unpaid and they can be for significant periods of time. Notably, studying nursing requires up to 800 hours of placement. Teaching requires 80 full days of placement, and social work requires up to 1,000 hours of a placement. And we find that the careers where placements are required are significantly female-dominated industries. For example, 92 per cent of workers across early childhood education and care are female and are required to undertake placement. 86 per cent of workers across residential aged care are female, 76 of the school workforce and 68 per cent of the disability workforce. So this is overwhelmingly focused um, on females building their career and having to deal with the, with the challenges that we have on placement. And we also know that placements have a disproportional effect on people from low SES backgrounds. Um, as is always the case, those with less get impacted more and struggle more, and we need to be looking at structures to change that. And so the Labor government, having a deep and abiding respect and commitment to higher education, to TAFE education, to vocational education of all sorts, and to addressing our skills crisis, has undertaken a range of steps to start trying to address this challenge. So the, um, the university's accord panel has handed down its interim report, and it's great to see that there are some good strategies proposed in that interim report. And the interim report is just the essential things for now. The final report will be in December. It has had spectacular engagement and is coming up with some excellent strategies to address some of these issues that we have seen festering and getting worse over the last 10 years. The placement issue was specifically referenced in the accord, and so I, like Senator Tyrrell, um, are quite excited about what the future might look like in addressing some of these deeply challenging and concerning issues. In addition, the government is working with education ministers across the country to consider the findings from the teacher education expert panel. Now, obviously, teaching is just one area where placement is an issue, but it is a significant one. Um, and the, the impact of unpaid placements on those students is something that those education ministers are looking very, very seriously at and have already come to some in principle supports. One of those is a national practical teaching guideline by the end of 2023, so only a couple of months away, uh, establishing a system-wide coordination of practical experience and undertaking work to increase a systemic investment in this area. So we are making progress. It is a critical area. We have a great deal of positivity about how this may play out, 
But let's not forget that this is off the back of 10 years of abject ignorance of the issue and of the needs of this country to develop the skills we need into the future, and that is at the foot of the coalition and their time in government. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Tyrrell, for putting up this MPI. This is something very close to my heart as well, because placement poverty is a pressing issue, and it has become even more urgent in the cost of living crisis. Uh, and a big shout out to Students Against Placement Poverty, who are running a national grassroots campaign for placements to be paid, because unpaid placements form part of a really cooked system of education that exploits student labor. We cannot keep turning away when we know that students are forced to do thousands of hours of unpaid placement work. These placements are often required um, you know, for those studying and training to become essential workers. Those who um, showed us during COVID lockdowns that it is only with their labor that we can have a functioning society and the most vulnerable among us to be looked after. These are the people we are training and then forcing them during that education to work for free. Hundreds of thousands of students across the country are required to complete unpaid mandatory work placements as part of their study. Placement poverty is gendered. Placements are especially common in feminized fields of study, teachers, nurses, social workers. Social work students have to undertake a thousand hours of compulsory placement and teaching requires more than 500 hours. On top of foregoing their income and not being paid for their work, students often have to fork out cash for travel, for parking, sometimes for professional clothing, leaving them out of pocket yet again. And it's particularly tough for students with parenting responsibilities or those who are already marginalized in society, including First Nations people and migrants. According to a survey by the Australian Council of Heads of Social Work Education, students are feeling exploited they are being used to fill labor shortages in organizations and provide free labor. One student reported, I spent the majority of my time cleaning out homes and transporting clients. I mean, this is harmful. This is just plain wrong. Students are being burnt out before they even begin their careers and left with absolutely no time to have a life outside of work. And they end up being shackled with massive student debts. And how is this fair? How is this equitable? Students should not be forced to provide their labor for free. The immense financial, physical, and emotional toll of student debt and unpaid placements is forcing people to drop out of university. This not only crushes their dreams of studying, but also means we have less teachers, less nurses, less engineers, less social workers, and other professions we desperately need. There is a pretty straightforward solution. Pay students for these placements. Students should be able to study for free and be paid for mandatory placements. No ifs, no buts. Senator Omar Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. During a cost of living crisis, it's, it is exploitation to push students into doing unpaid practical placements. We should be setting up students to succeed, but instead we force them to live in poverty and balance their work, placement and study commitments. To work in many of our sectors with the most extensive workforce shortages right now, like teaching, students are required to engage upon weeks upon weeks, sometimes even months, of unpaid work whilst barely subsisting on poverty stipends. Decades of neoliberal policies have reshaped universities away from being a public good into operating as corporations in a market. When we shape universities in this way, they are no longer about ensuring students are educationally enriched. It just becomes about numbers and incomes on screens, about shifting blocks of students for revenue. A decades-long bipartisan commitment to the privatisation of education has also driven thousands of passionate, experienced teachers out of the public education system. With the teacher workforce crisis deepening, we desperately need teachers to stay in the profession. But we also need university students to want to finish their teaching degrees and to join the teacher workforce. But if their first taste of the profession, whilst on prac, is months of poverty and a teacher's excessive workload, it's no wonder they don't stick around. 
Like my colleague Senator Faruqi, I too would like to express my solidarity with students against placement poverty who have been fighting for fairer conditions. Despite the hardship these students are facing, they're still rallying and organising for change. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for bringing this uh, matter of public importance to the Senate um, and support it wholeheartedly. Uh, clinical or practical placements for undergraduate students are integral to consolidating the skills and lessons taught in a formal classroom, but it comes at a cost to our students. And that is something that we need to think through, uh, particularly when we're looking across Australia and seeing people with jobs facing the cost of living crisis and doing it tough. It's very rare to see a placement that's a funded position. And quite often, uh, the universities can set their minimum hours with only broad guidance from professional bodies. According to the Department of Health and Aged Care, registered nurses require a minimum of 800 hours unpaid clinical placement. The AMA says medical students require 2,760 hours. Trainee physiotherapists require between 700 to 1,000 hours. For teachers, it's 600 hours, and for social workers, it's 1,000 hours. 1,000 hours is about 25, works, 20, 25 work weeks, essentially half a year of unpaid work. At the minimum wage, that equates to around $22,000 of free labour. Some may and, and, and probably will argue that, that that's just the cost of learning. But I would also remind people that students already pay to attend placements through their university fees and through under other mandatory requirements such as background checks and booster vaccinations. Uh, placements can extend up to four to eight weeks at a time. And all the while, a student still has to fund their usual cost of living. Some placements can include the requirements to travel vast distances or to live away from home, meaning students must live in a location where they do not have access to their regular employer or employers. It's a great deal of stress that we are putting on the shoulders of our future clinicians at a time where they should be focused on their studies. It has been put to me that clinical placements are already stressful enough and that with these additional strains we are launching our junior cl clinicians into their careers in states of mental and financial stress. We're hearing stories of people not actually finishing their studies due to the financial stress. I re reached out to one uh, clinician today to understand their experience. Here's what they had to say. During my placement, we were explicitly told not to work. This was because our placements were 40 hours a week for up to eight weeks. So it wouldn't be safe to work outside of this. People do though, and some worked as nursing assistants or enrolled nurses where they have a duty of care, which I think is dangerous. But you need money to live, so there's no real escaping it. There just aren't enough hours in the day to do eight hours of placement, then paid work, then uni work. And we're often used as paid staff even though we should have been supervised with everything we did. An understaffed unit is of course going to use the extra hands to their advantage, rather than focusing on education and development of those students. This is just one experience, but I'm sure it will ring familiar with many clinicians across the country that have had to weigh their studies with placements with the regular pressures of life and family. In a cost of living crisis where young people, particularly students, often feel the pinch most acutely, it is time that we look at this area. Again, I thank Senator Tyrrell for bringing this to the Senate today and hope we can continue with the conversation on behalf of the future clinicians that we so desperately need in our health and social services systems. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. One Nation supports the general principle that this motion proposes, that students should not have to go broke to finish their studies. The medical colleges currently rely on huge numbers of students paying their own out-of-pocket costs and even thousands of hours of unpaid placements in addition to their studies. 
The real conversation we need to have is the artificial monopoly, though, that medical colleges hold over students in this country. Australia is crying out for health professionals, and the fees to see them are too high for some people. While this is happening, the medical colleges punitively restrict the amount of places available for students, denying Australians a proper supply of trained professionals and ensuring students have nowhere else to turn. We need to have a second look at the medical colleges. And we need to have a look at the universities who are punishing some people who have completed their, their academic studies and just, willing to, just needing to do their practical courses, and the universities are forcing them out because of mandates for COVID injections. That's inhuman. Three to four years' work and their contract broken. Thank you. The time for discussion has now expired.